This is the debunk of whale ancestors having lived on land. You'll have to bear with me because it was quite hard to amass this information, it was hard to get this information together, it took me quite a long time and the reason for that was because scientists themselves seemed to be confused about this information. It was hard to find the information so if it is a fact, there's a clear evidence that whales went from mammal to marine mammal, then they're not very proud of this fact because, as I say, the information was very hard to come by. And remember, this is the information age. We live in the information age, so if you were proud that something was a fact like that, surely it would be easy to come across, and it wasn't. I was going to take you through the time periods. Now, bear with me on this video because it actually is interesting. The things that you find out about whales that you're going to end up finding out about whales, I'm sure you're going to appreciate them, so just stick with me on this. Now I'll show you this one first rather than the other one so that you can kind of get a picture in your head first. These are the animals here. It came from this line. It went up and then it became Basilosaurus. So there's Pachycetus there, Amblocetus there, Cuchycetus there, Rhodocetus there, Dorodon and then uh, dolphins are Odontocetes and whales are Mysticetes. So they're saying that Mysticetes and Odontocetes came from the line here that split off and became Dorodon, right? So that's just to quickly get that information into your mind there as a visual thing. So let's go back now to the time periods that they say. So they said that Pachycetus was 52 to 48 million years ago, Amblocetus was 50 to 48 million years ago, Cuchycetus was 46 to 43 million years ago, Protocetus was 45 million years ago, Dorodon was 40 to 43 million years ago, and Basilosaurus was 40 to 34 million years ago. Now when you go to Wales, the textbooks will tell you, well Wikipedia, Wikipedia says that whales are 55 million years old, and it also says that dolphins are 55 million years old, so already there's a, a contradiction there because they're saying that whales are 55 million years ago when the actual ancestor of whales, Pachycetus, is only 52 million years old. Now that doesn't really work out, that's whales being 3 million years older than Pachycetus. Now, Pachycetus was a dog-like animal, Amblocetus was a crocodile-like animal, Cuchycetus was a otter-like animal, Protocetus was a dolphin-like animal, Dorodon was, I think it was a, a reptile-like animal, and so was Basilosaurus, a reptile-like animal. There's an overlap in the time periods, I mean 58 to 48 million years ago. What they're trying to say is that Pachycetus, over a period of time, gave birth to Amblocetus, Amblocetus, after a certain amount of time, gave birth to Cuchycetus, and so on and so on. But Amblocetus and Pachycetus were actually alive at the same time. They were alive at the same time. In fact, there's a 2 million year overlap. They're saying that this one died out 48 million years ago, but this one only came alive 46 million years ago and lived to 43 million years ago. So there's an overlap with the next one, Protocetus, that was alive 45 million years ago. So don't you think that if there's an overlap, there's actually more evidence just to say that these were a group of animals who lived in roughly the same time period? Doesn't necessarily mean that they're the ancestors of whales. And if I take you over again, okay, to Basilosaurus, which is here. So they're saying that, you know, Basilosaurus did come from the same line as Pachycetus and Bolocetus and all of them after, that came after. But Basilosaurus has got nothing to do with the development of whales and dolphins. So if I take that back and I show you the sizes, it says that Pachycetus was a one to two meter long animal, Amblocetus was a three meter length animal, Cuchycetus was two and a half meters, Protocetus was two and a half meters, and Dorodon was five meters. Basilosaurus, which has got nothing to do with the development of whales and dolphins, but again I'm saying that there's a confusion of the information, they're not too sure themselves how they want to put this information. You'd think that they would want to be proud of it, but they're not. So Basilosaurus isn't actually anything to do with it, but I've put it in here anyway because they are confused about it themselves, that's the reason why. The largest whale is 30 metres long, and the smallest whale is 2.5 metres long. 
The largest dolphin is two and a half meters long and the smallest dolphin is 140 centimeters long. So there's a big difference between the sizes in the groups of whales and dolphins. There's a large variety of whales and dolphins. There's only one animal of the beings that supposedly came before it and, and, and gave rise, gave birth to whales. But yeah, there's many whales and there's many dolphins. So a five meter animal overnight turned into a 30 meter animal and then a two and a half meter animal. It also became a two and a half meter whale and it also became a 140 centimeter dolphin overnight. There's a big gap in believability just kind of looking at the information as a standalone, a standalone thing. So let me get a calculator here quickly as well. If I show you right, the Pachycetus, as, well, as I said, was a dog-like animal at 52 million years old. Yeah, the time scales, right? Okay, so the time scales, going back to the confusement of the information, they're saying that whales are 55 million years old, but they're not really. What they're saying is that all of these animals together are 55 million years old, and whales diverged from that line 40 million years ago. And then dolphins, it seems that they're saying it split again and became dolphins 34 million years ago. So even although they're giving dolphins the, the credence of having been 55 million years old, when you really look at it, it's actually 34 million years old. But they still attach themselves, both whales and dolphins, to being 55 million years old because the truth is they're unsure about the information and they're not sure how to put it across in a confident way because there's an uncertainty there. So if I take you to even the, the farthest away time period of 40 million years that whales diverged from this line, so Pachycetus was a dog-like animal, and then 40 million years ago dolphins split from that line, that gives us 12 million years. So what they're saying is that Pachycetus, a dog-like animal, after 12 million years, Pachycetus became a whale. But whales have lived successfully on the land for 40 million years. So again, there's a big gap in believability there because if a dog can become a whale after 12 million years and evolution is supposed to be a continual process that's involuntary, you don't have a choice, it's an involuntary thing, it just continually happens, then how can a dog become a whale after 12 million years, but whales have stayed as whales for 40 million years? So there's a big gap in believability there. So let's move on. Now this slide here is from Wikipedia, and this slide here is from Berkeley. So I've went to the most established sources to give evolutionists the fairest chance. What they're saying is that all of these animals came from a, an unknown ungulate animal. Um, it went and became Pachycetidae, Ambulocetidae, Remingtonocetidae, Protocetidae, Dorodontidae, then it became all whales and all dolphins. So what this is here is an unknown animal. Somehow this unknown animal magically overnight became hippopotamus. This unknown an animal magically overnight became hippopotamus and uh, there's no in-between animal, there's no explanation for that. There's a, a big gap that they can't fill. Then it became all of these animals. And then from Dorodon, right, even if you follow the line through, they've went to, to great pains to explain this part of the line, but I'm saying the chances are they were probably just completely different animals who lived during roughly the same time period. They're saying that overnight Dorodon became all dolphins and all whales. So what evolution won't tell you is that, see this here, it's a missing link and they don't know the missing links for any animal. They actually don't know the missing links for any animals. On the one hand they're telling you that evolution is a, a slow gradual process but what really we're seeing is that an unknown animal that they don't know overnight became hippopotamus and then this animal here, Dorodon, overnight it became all dolphins and all whales. Now this is the complexity of all of the whale and dolphin species that actually are in existence, uh, they're both hunting animals, but dolphins have teeth and whales don't. What we are saying is that, don't you find it galling that within 12 million years, a dog can become 
all of these animals and for 40 million years these animals have stayed the same they haven't changed at all so they've had 40 million years a chance to evolve and they haven't changed at all and a dog that lived on the land pacasitis only had 12 million years before it became all of these wondrous species overnight now when it's a known animal what you'll find is that they freely admit that they don't know which of these animals was first and which of these animals came last when it's known animals that we can go we can look at them we can study them we can take their dna we can run it through computer models we can put it under electron microscope we can run tests on it when it comes to a known animal they fully admit well we don't know we don't know which one of these animals came first which one came last or in what sequential order it happened but for some strange reason when we look many many distant eons into the past they say we know for sure that this animal came then that animal came then that animal came then and that animal is the thousandth grandson of that animal and that animal is the two thousandth grandson of that animal and then (laughs) it goes back to a certain point where they say well there's a missing link and we don't know and there's missing links for every single animal on earth that's what they don't tell you but what they're trying to say is that many many distant eons into the past they know for sure the sequential order that these animals came into existence but when it's animals that we can fully study and that we fully know we admit we don't understand exactly when they came into existence and in what sequential order it happened so i wanted to look at some of the characteristics of the animals to show how different they are because there are some characteristics that are unique and fundamental to all whales and all dolphins all whales and all dolphins have the nose at the top of their skull and all whales and all dolphins have tail flukes so if we look into it okay so pachycetus was a wolf like land mammal it was semi-aquatic and its nose was at the end of its snout ambulocetus was a crocodile like amphibian it probably lived in the water its nose was at the end of its snout it had no echolocation and it had no tail flukes so uh, all whales and all dolphins can also echolocate Cuchocetus is an otter-like mammal, it probably lived in the water, its nose was at the end of its snout, it had no echolocation and it had no tail flukes. So to cut a long story short, basically, if you follow the characteristics of all these animals, you know, it jumps around from a wolf to a crocodile to an otter to a dolphin, back to a reptile, another reptile. None of these animals had their nose at the top of their skull, none of them have tail flukes and none of them have equal location so these are all central fundamental aspects of all whales and all dolphins so evolution goes to great pains to tell you that it's a process a very slow and gradual process that that gradually happens over millions and millions of years but even if you do take that model and you follow it through right follow that model through at the end of the day whether evolutionists like it or not Tail flukes appeared overnight, echolocation appeared overnight, and all whales and all dolphins having the nose at the, the top of their skull all appeared overnight. None of the rest of these animals had any of those things. And you would think in science, if you were going to prove something, that you would have to have strong causal relationships going all the way back. If you're the one who is the proponent of a theory, if you're putting a theory forward, then it has to be you who proves that theory. But there isn't actually any strong causal links between these animals whatsoever so whether you like it or not echolocation and tail flukes tail flukes is what propels dolphins and whales in the water if they didn't have it they wouldn't be able to survive they all have their noses at the top of their skull they all have echolocation and they all have tail flukes and none of these animals have that This is the internal anatomy of a couple of whales here, just so that you can see the complexity of it. So, if a dog-like animal was to become all of this after 12 million years, it would have had to have changed its skeleton, its body structure. Aside from the, the parts that I was telling you about, the tail flukes, the nose being at the top of the skull, and the echolocation, this is the part that produces echolocation, the melon. It's an extremely complex organism and none of the ancestors behind these animals have had a melon. 
or have a melon and can do equal location. It's a very complex thing and there's no causal relationships going back to any of the animals previous that had a melon or had tail flukes or had the nose in this position here. So if a dog was going to become all whales and all dolphins over a period of 12 million years, it would have to change its skeleton, its internal anatomy, its body structure, the way it breathes, its muscle structure. It would have to incorporate completely new organisms into its body structure, and it would have to massively, massively increase its size. Now, there is no causal relationship going backwards that can explain any of these things, despite them saying that it's well researched, the progression from mammal to marine mammal, they're saying it's well researched and well evidenced, but it's not. None of these things appear in the animals before them. So just to give you an idea of the size, this is a humpback whale. It's actually the humpback whale. There's its skeleton there to show you how different the skeleton would be to a, a dog or any of the, the animals it, it had supposedly descended from. It would also these things would also have to massively, massively increase in size. Even if we compare a humpback whale, which is not the biggest whale, to some of the largest mammals that we have on the land, it is actually immensely bigger than even those mammals. This is a human there. Uh, standing inside the skull of a bowhead whale. I would say probably that the human is um Maybe not even an eighth, maybe not even an eighth of the size of a bowhead whale's skull, a bowhead whale's head. A human's not even the eighth of the size, just to get a grasp on the sizes, what would have actually have had to have happened. This is the muscle structure, to show you the very complex muscle structure that would have had to have came into existence. There's no causal relationship going behind these animals to say that this could happen. There's another example of the complex muscle structure to see the reality of it. Now, just to let you know that a dog is about the third of the size of a human here in this picture, but the whale, the blue whale, is uh, infinitely more massive than a human, and this is what would have had to have happened if, if a dog that lived only 12 million years before this animal was the 10,000th grandfather or 20,000th grandfather of this animal. A blue whale is not just bigger than a human, it's actually bigger than all of the largest animals that have ever lived. The largest animal that has ever lived is a blue whale, and they're saying that 12 million years previous to that, this majestic being was a dog, and there's nothing wrong with dogs. Dogs are smart, and, and dogs can do plenty of things. Dogs are good at what dogs do, but whales are good at what they do, and there's no causal relationship to say that, that dogs have any propensity to becoming whales. I mean, wolves must have been on the earth for millions of years as well. They've never shown any propensity towards becoming whales, but we are supposed to believe that a select species of dog 12 million years before this animal became all whales and all dolphins. Now, bats, this is a micro bat. Bats are important in this talk because bats are mammals, right? That's a micro bat. And micro bats fly by using echolocation. And that's a fruit bat. And fruit bats don't fly by echolocation. Fruit bats fly just by sight. Fruit bats don't use echolocation. So, bats are mammals. Now, bats are flying mammals. They're the only mammal that can fly. And scientific theory of evolution admits that they have got no idea how mammals came to fly. Bats are the only mammals that can fly. And evolutionists admit they're completely stumped to explain how bats came to fly. And also, as I was saying, this one flies by Micro bats fly by echolocation, and fruit bats, larger mega bats, don't fly by echolocation, they fly by sight. So, even within species, again, that we do know about, they have behavioural differences that we can't understand and we don't have explanations for. And it's the same with uh, the variety of the species of whales. We're saying that millions of years ago, 
in the distant, distant past, we know exactly what animals were around and exactly the line, the lineage that they created to make whales. But we can study whales and we don't actually know where the whales that we can study actually came from or when they came into existence. It's a, just a best guess and it's a very wide guess that they're giving us a very wide estimation and again with the bats we don't know how mammals came to fly there's absolutely zero explanation to say how it happened and um that one's got a big penis so it's distracting me but <laughs> we also don't understand the behavioral differences in the groups of animals that we can actually study so let's just get into that for a wee second. Bats, there's a thousand bat species, but there's no evolutionary links. Bats are among the most diverse mammal groups, with around 1,000 species worldwide. Yet evolutionists don't have a clue how they could have evolved. What that means is there's a thousand bat species, and every single species that they look into its past lineage, it always comes from a bat. There's no point where it doesn't come from a bat and it can't fly. So within a thousand species, they've got a thousand species to study and choose from, but they cannot find any lineage that doesn't go back to an animal that can't fly or came from the ground. And what they are saying, the whole reason that evolution has to explain this is because they are saying that all mammals evolved on land. So if the most distant ancestor of mammals was all on land. They need to then provide an explanation for how mammals got into the water and they then need to provide an explanation for how mammals became to fly because it's their theory and they are the ones who have to prove it but they can't. They can't prove how bats can fly and the truth is that they can't prove how mammals got into the sea either. I think the reason that they're stuck in this position is because whales are a popular animal and they're clearly mammals. Because whales is a popular animal, they probably felt as if they would have to do a big public show of explaining how mammals basically walked back into the sea. They developed on land and then they walked into the sea, changing, as I said, their entire muscle structure, their entire skeleton, their entire breathing apparatus. And they have went to all these pains to explain that, but there's a thousand different bat species and no matter how many bat species there never goes back to a point where it wasn't a bat. The strange thing is that no one's questioning the theory. They're just allowed to continue on with this bizarre theory that has no actual scientific proof or evidence behind it. They're just allowed to continue on with this story because it's became the accepted theory. But if there was another theory, if it had so many gaping holes in it, and this is over a hundred, more than a hundred years since Darwin first came out with this theory and they still haven't explained large gaps in its understanding and if another theory had over a hundred years not been able to explain itself over that length of time, people would eventually question the theory, but that's not happening with evolution. Another kind of galling thing is that talking about the bats, the current thinking on it is that all these 1,000 bats, okay, actually evolved independently of each other, so that's even more galling for them, because that means that, say bats did come from a common ancestor, that's not what they are saying. They are not saying that. They are saying that uh, they came from 1,000 different species, and so from, what, from those 1,000 different species, they can't figure out how if there any of them ever lived on the land. They've always flown and they're always bats. It's even more galling for them to admit that they think that all these different bats didn't diverge from a common ancestor. The earliest fossil bats, which evolutionists date at more than 50 million years, are clearly identifiable as bats, with no hint that they have evolved from anything that was not a bat. Most bat scientists apparently think that bats evolved from tree-dwelling, shrew-like ancestors that scampered along branches and fed on insects. But Sharon Swartz, an associate professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at Brown University, has done aerodynamic studies on bats and said that going from a square gliding wing to a long skinny flapping wing is a unique achievement and now it doesn't look like bats have any relationship to these gliding things, she said. So what that means is that they originally put forward bats as having come from 
kind of like flying squirrels basically but now a woman who has looked into it, Sharon Swartz, she's saying, well, to be honest, there isn't any evidence whatsoever that bats came from gliding animals. So that, that was the original thought process, and then they actually studied it and found out there's no evidence whatsoever that bats came from gliding animals. And that was the only thing that, that could save their theory that all mammals developed on land, and then it went into the sky, and then they went into the water. They're the ones that have to prove it. If you are the one who puts forward a theory, you are the one who has to prove it. It doesn't get accepted as a proven theory until you have proven it. And if you haven't proven it, then the theory is not as strong as you thought it was. Uh, again, this vertebrate flight, this slide is from Berkeley. Chiroptera in flight. The Chiroptera, or bats, are the second most diverse group of mammals and are the only mammals ever to evolve through powered flight. The evolutionary origin of Chiropterans is still somewhat of a mystery because the fossil records of bats is scant. Some cladistic analyses indicate that bats are most closely related to the Dermopterans, such as the flying lemur which does not fly and is not a lemur, strangely enough, but others suggest that they are not so closely related. However, their ancestors may have been similar in some ecological respects. So let me break that down for you, right? The Chiroptera or bats are the second most diverse group of mammals and they're the only mammals to have true powered flight. So uh, they're the second most diverse. There's a thousand different species of bat, but none of them have ever not been born from a bat and they're just a very diverse group of animals the second most diverse group of mammals that we have evidence of the evolutionary origin of them is a mystery we think that they're related to flying lemurs but flying lemurs are not lemurs and they don't fly <laughs> strangely enough so again reality is stranger than science they are saying oh they could be related to that there's no evidence to say that there is, because if there was evidence to say that there is, they would definitely say it. So when they say that others suggest that they are not so closely related, what that is, is it's a kind of sleight of hand protection of the evolution theory. Because see, if there was evidence that bats did come from flying lemurs, we would definitely know about it, and it would definitely be available. They've kept very quiet about how they don't know that bats have never come from something that's not a bat and doesn't fly. Bats have never come from the ground, which is what they would need to explain because the model of evolution tells us that all mammals developed on land. And then it says, however, their ancestors may have been similar in some ecological respects. Now, what that again is a missing link, what I told you about before, that there are no missing links for any animals. What they're saying is, oh, their ancestors might have been similar, but they don't know what that ancestor is. So again, it's a sleight of hand defence of the evolution theory. And this is from Berkeley. This slide is from Berkeley. This isn't me trying to trick people. Now, animal species are diverse. It's not a mystery. Bird species are diverse and mammal species are diverse, they're going to great pains to try and explain how mammals got into the water. They're not going to great pains to explain how mammals came to fly because they can't explain it. The reason that they can't explain it is not because they, there's still information that they've yet to find. The reason that they can't explain it is because evolution is a failed theory. That's the reason that they can't explain it. Birds are a very diverse group, but we're not going to great pains to explain anything about birds. We've got birds like uh, ostriches, which can't fly, flightless birds. We've got birds like ducks, which are semi-aquatic. They can live on the water or on the land. We've got penguins, birds which um, don't fly, but they're brilliant swimmers. They're more adapted to swimming. And we've got birds like the robin, which is both a migratory bird and a resident bird. Now, some robins migrate and some of them don't. Some robins stay within a few miles of the home nest that they were reared in for their whole entire lives. Again, it goes back to the fact that we can study robins, but we still don't really understand why some of them are resident and some of them are migratory. It's the same with bats. We don't understand why some of them equilocate and some of them can't equilocate. There's lots of diverse birds around, but we're not going to great pains to explain the evolution of 
why some birds can't fly, why some birds can live on the land and in the water, why some birds can only swim and why some birds are resident birds and why some birds are migratory birds. I think the reason that we're not going to great pains to explain that is because, as I previously said, whales are a great animal so it probably they felt like you know, we're going to have to come up with an explanation of how mammals got into the sea because whales and dolphins are very popular animals that are prominent in the human psyche or the collective conscious of the world. They're just very prominent animals. I've went to Great Plains to explain it, but we can't explain it. And that's because evolution is a failed theory that hasn't been able to explain this for over a hundred years or more, and there's no hope that's going to change. To be honest, they've probably given up on trying to explain where bats came from. The reason they can't explain it is because bats never lived on the land, and whales never lived on the land. That's the reason that they can't explain it. So let's go into some of the uniqueness of whales and dolphins just to kind of have gave you the general narrative of why these animals are so unique and why they couldn't possibly have come from mammals that lived on the land and how there's no causal relationship going back into their so-called ancestors for any of the, the changes in the skeleton. And now I'm going to look into exact organisms that, again, even if you follow the fossil record through, these things completely appeared overnight, there's no explanations or causal relationships going into the past as to how these animals are so complex and the complex organisms that exist in their living systems. So baleen is a filter feeder system inside the mouth of baleen whales. The baleen system works when a whale opens its mouth under water and the whale takes in water. The whale then pushes the water out and animals such as krill are filtered by the baleen and remain as food source for the whale. Baleen is similar to bristles and is made of keratin, the same substance found in human fingernails and hair. Some whales, such as the bowhead whale, have longer baleen than others. Other whales, such as the grey whale, only use use one side of their baleen. These baleen bristles are arranged in plates across the upper jaw of the whale. Baleen is also often called whalebone. Depending on the species, a baleen plate can be 0.5 metres to 3.5 metres. That's a very big difference. It can weigh up to 90 kilograms. Its hairy fringes are called baleen hair or whale bone hair. So whales wouldn't be able to feed if it wasn't for baleen and some of the whales have different types of baleen and they use their baleen in different ways to each other and there's no causal relationships behind any of the, the so-called ancestors that lived on land that had baleen. This is some pictures of the baleen here, there, to see how complex it is and how different it is in the various species. It's actually beautiful. Eh, that's quite beautiful, that picture there. Now look at that, the baleen on the bowhead whale there. Um, look how long it is, look how complex that organism is, the organism of baleen. There's an argument for irreducible complexity there. If whales didn't have their baleen, they wouldn't be able to eat food, they wouldn't be able to feed, so they wouldn't be able to exist. Whales wouldn't be able to exist without their baleen. And as I've explained, there's no causal relationship going back into the past that any other animals have had baleen, even the ones that have been selected as so-called ancestors of whales. There's another wee picture there to show you the extreme complexity and the, the street, extreme wide range of baleen that's in whales. I'm going to show you now some of the most complex and unique things that, that whales can do. So sperm whales sleep standing up. Until fairly recently, whales were all thought to share the sleep pattern of dolphins who sleep with half their brain, letting them keep one eye open for threats. However, a group of scientists in 2013 following sperm whales fitted with location tags discovered something very different and bizarre. They found the whole pod just off the coast of Chile with their bodies completely vertical to the surface of the water and their heads bobbing at the surface. Uh, this means that sperm whales sleep in one of the weirdest ways known within the animal kingdom. We think that they dive down and grab snatches of sleep that can last up to 12 minutes and then slowly drift to the surface head first. So whales are the only animals in the 
the animal kingdom that can do this. It's a very complex thing and no ancestors behind them could do this. It's even different to all the other whale species and all the other dolphin species. Again, it's the whole thing of we're able to study whales but we we are able to study these animals but we're actually only scratching the surface of what we can understand about whales that we do know exist and we can go and study them but we're always so certain about the very very distant past for some reason. Unihemispheric sleep is how some species of dolphins sleep. Unihemispheric sleep is the ability to sleep with one half of the brain while the other half remains alert. This is in contrast to normal sleep where both eyes are shut and both halves of the brain show reduced consciousness. The behaviour remains an important research topic because unihemispheric sleep is possibly the first animal behaviour which uses different regions of the brain to simultaneously control sleep and wakefulness. So. If we read between the lines, what it's saying there is that there's no ancestor before dolphins that can do unihemispheric sleep and it's obviously an extremely complex thing. There's irreducible complexity. If dolphins couldn't do unihemispheric sleep, these particular dolphins, they wouldn't be able to survive. And even if you follow the fossil record completely through, this appeared overnight. Unihemispheric sleep appeared overnight. Sleeping standing up appeared overnight, ballying appeared overnight, all of these various things appeared overnight. Whales feed by swallowing their weight in water. Scientists have discovered that whales have a mysterious organ shared by no other known animal on earth. This organ, which is about the size of a grapefruit, is located in the chins of baleen whales. Nobody knows quite what the organ does just yet, however it's assumed that it's what allows whales to lunge feed. Lunge feeding is when whales rush headlong at their prey and completely engulf swarms of them by swallowing the surrounding water. This means taking on huge amounts of water. During lunge feeding, whales can actually absorb as much as their own body weight in water. So, whales can absorb their own body weight in water. They're the largest animal on earth. Some of them are the largest animals in the history of all beings and they wouldn't be able to lunge feed if they didn't have grapefruit sized organism that science still doesn't understand in their chins. It's the whole galling thing. There's no causal relationship behind any of the previous ancestors that had a grapefruit sized organ in their chin that would allow them to lunge feed and it's a very complex process. No other animal would be able to do this. Whale vocalisation. So whales and dolphins use sound. Whale sounds are used by whales for different kinds of communication. The mechanisms used to produce sound vary from one family of cetaceans to another. Marine mammals such as whales, dolphins and porpoises are much more dependent on sound for communication and sensation than are land mammals because other senses are of limited effectiveness in water. Sight is less effective for marine mammals because of the way particulates in the ocean scatter light. The word song is used to describe the pattern of regular and predictable sounds made by some species of whales, notably the humpback whale. This is included with or in comparison with music and male humpback whales have been described as inverted composers of songs that are strikingly similar to human musical traditions. So what we're finding here is that whales use their song to communicate to each other and they're described as inverted composers. So what they the sounds and songs that they produce are strikingly similar to human music. Humans consider their music to be an art form. And what we're basically saying here is that whales can produce sound that is equal to what humans can do in music, and that is extremely complex. Maybe they're talking about its range, its pitch, its tone. They can do similar to what humans can do in music, and humans consider what they can do in music to be an art form. So these aren't dumb animals. There's a suggestion there to say that there's high complex thought processes going on, high levels of conscious thought. The dolphins and all the different families of cetaceans use their strong in different ways. The different species of animals and even the different families of animals within that is very different to each other. If we are saying that 
all whales and all dolphins came from a dog that lived on the land only 12 million years previous to what these animals can do. You would think that there would be a DNA stock that they came from, and you would think that there would be generic behaviours then, but there isn't generic behaviours they're using, so long that's completely different to each other, and they're also using it to an extremely high complex level. The production of sound, humans produce sound by expelling air through the larynx, the vocal cords within the larynx open and close as necessary to separate the stream of air into discrete pockets of air. These pockets are shaped by the throat, tongue and lips into the desired sound, allowing humans to speak. Cetacean sound production differs markedly from this mechanism. The precise mechanism differs in the two major suborders of cetacean, the toothed whales and the baleen whales, so the dolphins and the whales. So we produce our sound by using a larynx that requires vocal cords and that's how we control the air to make the sound and cetaceans can produce sound that is uh, on a par with what we can do but they do it in a completely different way and again ramming home the point there's no causal relationships behind dolphins for this dolphins and whales sorry dolphins produce their sound using phonic lips, that's where the phonic lips are here, and I got a picture of it, that's the phonic lips there in a c-section. What we're about to find out is that the melon uh, produces the sound that goes out, and then it comes back in, they receive sound in their chins, and it's a complex production of airflow, very complex process that they manipulate air through these parts and then receive it back in through this part. There's no other animal on earth which has phonic lips and none of dolphins' supposed ancestors had phonic lips. The multiple sounds dolphins make are produced by passing air through a structure in the head called the phonic lips. This structure functions like the human nasal cavity as the air passes through this narrow passage. The phonic lip membranes are sucked together causing the surrounding tissue to vibrate. These vibrations can, as with the vibrations in the human larynx, be consciously controlled with great sensitivity. The vibrations pass through the tissue of the head to the melon which shapes and directs the sound into a beam of sound useful in equal location. Every toothed whale except the sperm whale has two sets of phonic lips and is thus capable of making two sounds independently. Once the air has passed the phonic lips, it enters the vestibular sac. From there, the air may be recycled back into the lower part of the nasal complex ready to be used for sound creation again or passed out through the blowhole. I mean, this is a highly complex structure that is innate to this animal. This is a highly complex thing that is innate to this animal. This didn't evolve over millions of years from bottom feeder animals that could only survive for two million years on the land. And there we go, that's what it looks like in reality. That's the acoustic transmitter there, the top of the head, the melon, and then they receive the sound in through there in their cheeks. And he looks quite happy about that. He's not he knows that he didn't come from a dog that only lived 12 million years before him. Baleen whales don't have phonic lips, so again we're finding that there's completely different mechanisms for how these animals produce sound, and sound is a fundamental part of their daily lives, how they communicate, how they find a mate, etc, etc. So baleen whales don't have phonic lips though, and instead they have a larynx that appears to play a role in sound production, but they lack vocal cords and scientists remain uncertain as to the exact mechanism. The process, however, cannot be completely analogous to humans because whales do not have to exhale in order to produce sound. It is likely that they recycle air around the body for this purpose. Cranial sinuses may also be used to create the sounds, but again, researchers are currently unclear how. So there's a few things going on here. Scientists are trying to say that all whales and all dolphins came from a genetic stock, a, a narrow genetic stock that came from dogs that lived on the land only 12 million years previous to them, but when we look at it, all of these detailed things that I'm showing you, there's no causal relationships 
to say that any of these animals before whales and dolphins had any of these complex organisms. Again, if you follow the evolutionary line through, all of these complex organisms appeared overnight, and that's not what evolution says. Evolution says it takes millions of years for things to happen, and we're also finding that they didn't actually come from a genetic genetic stock. They use sound in their daily lives, it's innate to their living systems and they have completely, completely different ways of producing this sound. And not only that, more galling than even all of that is that we can actually go and study these animals whenever we like and we can't actually understand the complex organisms that they do have. We're only scratching the surface of understanding of these things which are within our grasp to understand and we can't understand them even when we throw in all of our scientific might at it. But again, the galling thing is that they're saying they do know for a fact that millions and millions of years ago, animals that they don't know a lot about, that they definitely produced all whales and all dolphins. So whales have got a larynx but they don't have vocal cords. Scientists can't understand that and they can't understand how they manipulate the air around their body. So that's very, very galling for an evolutionary theory. Whales are the actually the loudest animals on earth. That's another thing. So the call of the blue whale reaches levels up to 188 decibels. This extraordinarily loud whistle can be heard for hundreds of miles underwater. Theoretical calculations by Roger Payne and Douglas Webb from the 1970s predicted that the loudest whale sounds might be transmitted across an entire ocean. The blue whale is much louder than a jet, which reaches only 140 decibels. Human shouting is 70 decibels, and sounds over 120 decibels are painful to human ears. The second loudest animal on Earth is the howler monkey from the jungles of Central and South America. So, even with all man's scientific might, the loudest things that he can create, well, guess what? Whales are louder than that. If humans weren't making so much noise at the tops of the oceans with all of the different machines, blue whales could transmit their sounds across the entire ocean, and that is how complex and wondrous these animals are. They're the kings of the sea, basically they're the kings down there transmitting their sounds across entire oceans, and uh, humans that have see themselves as the peak of all civilization can't even create sounds that are as loud as what whales can create. Bowhead whales can live for more than 200 years. In 2007, a dead bowhead whale being studied by scientists was found to have something very strange embedded within it. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be a weapon fragment that dated back to a patent filed in 1879. This suggests the bowhead whale survived a whaling attack more than 100 years earlier. Scientists actually can't agree on the bowhead whale's maximum lifespan. Amino acids in the eyes of bowhead whales suggest that the oldest ever discovered may have been up to 211. So that's actually a very, very advantageous adaption. It kind of debunks the whole genetic, the generic genetic stock thing because if all animals are supposed to be evolving towards their higher state of being and it's an un involuntary process that always happens then being able to live until you're 211 years old is a very very advantageous thing to do. These bowhead whales can live infinitely longer than humans and they can probably live infinitely longer than other whales and other dolphins. Now that's galling because it doesn't, that means that pretty much they don't come from generic genetic stock because if one whale can evolve that then why didn't all whales evolve it? Because it's a very advantageous thing, it's a very advantageous adaption. It kind of proves that all whales and all dolphins we didn't come from a generic genetic stock. Now look at the majesty of these beings, look how powerful they are, look how beautiful they are. They're some of the most wondrous examples that we have of beauty, of power, of intelligence. These animals didn't come from bottom feeder animals that could only live on the land for two million years. Some of the animals that they say these majestic beings came from only lived on, on the land for 
two million years or less and that's embarrassing to say that because that means that you're a horrible survivor that means that you weren't a survivor and you died out you were a bottom feeder animal that achieved nothing whales have survived on the on the earth that we know about supposedly for 40 million years so a dog that wasn't very complex and was maybe only the 50,000th grandfather of this animal it couldn't actually survive on the land it was a bottom feeder animal and it died out after 2 million years did not is not the ancestor of all whales and all dolphins so if you want to go and look it up there's a video online of whales having um, been stuck on a fish line its fin was stuck on a fish line and then it went to a boat that had humans on it it was kind of tapping the side of a boat and drawing attention to itself and then the humans after maybe about half an hour or 40 minutes they managed to deprise this fishing line off of the whale's fin and then when the humans got it off it started doing flips and tricks and thrusting itself out of the water and partly it was just swimming because it had enjoyed itself but the people who were in the boat felt like the moment felt like the whale itself was doing a bit of a show for the people who had helped it and not only that but i would say that there seemed to be an understanding from the whale that you know this is a human contraption that i'm stuck in so i'm going to go to humans it seemed to either understand that humans were the ones who were at fault for it so if the humans were at fault for it aren't the humans the best people to go to to fix it and if the whale didn't have that complexity of thought it felt like that if the whale didn't have that complexity of thought it certainly seemed like the whale understood that humans maybe have a lot of dexterity and that they would be able to help and that is why he alerted himself to the humans and he alerted them to that problem another thing is I would recommend the documentary Blackfish and in the documentary Blackfish it suggests that killer whales and other dolphins they have a a powerful third eye and in some ways that they can transmit conscious thoughts into other beings like humans other beings that have a high intelligence level dolphins can transmit using their third eye forms of consciousness into the minds of other beings and to be honest what we're talking about here is extremely extremely high complex conscious thought and there's no way that animals that are so beautiful so powerful i can't even understand how, how a big animal massive animal like that can actually thrust itself out of the water i don't understand how that can actually happen the forces that are at play are probably so mathematically complex that it's actually hard to fathom and uh, also uh, with their whale sound and as i'm describing with the dolphins having a powerful third die that can transmit conscious thought we're talking about extremely complex conscious beings that in my opinion were designed by god whether you want to believe that or not that's up to you but that's what i'm saying i, I don't know what what god is if god is maybe a hive conscious mind i don't know but these animals certainly did not evolve only 12 million years previous all animals, that all whales, all dolphins certainly did not come from bottom feeder animals that barely survived on the land. They're just too beautiful and majestic for that. The truth is we don't know where these animals came from. That is the truth. Whether you want to believe it's God or not or a powerful conscious entity, otherworldly entity, you don't have to believe that but certainly there's not enough proof in evolution that these animals came from dogs that lived on the land only 12 million years previous to themselves especially considering there's no causal relationships to any of the complex organisms that exist within their bodies and living structures now i've given you the um this is only the generic narrative that i've given you um because i'm debunking evolution i feel like i've got to go into it in an extremely detailed manner otherwise people aren't going to i don't want to um, leave any information hanging because I'm, I'm going up against all of science here so you know give me a break give me my juice um, so now after this I'm going to show the detailed aspects of the, the skeletal structures that they say were found the skeletal structures of the animals that were previous to whales so I've given you the generic narrative and now we're going to go to 
all of these animals, what actual evidence have they found of these animals? And I'll show you the detailed breakdown of that so that we, you can get the full debunk on it.